Hi Hermits, welcome back to my channel. My name is Dara and today we are going to do a little review of how my reading has been going so far. So we're going to start by looking at some stats because I <laughs> moved everything from Goodreads to Storygraph for the specific reason that I want to look at their stats, their stats are better. So we're going to talk about those. We are going to work through some of the questions from the mid-year free cap tag. And then also some questions of my own, because I feel like there are things that I want to talk about and want to reflect on that are not encompassed in that tag. So this is going to be like a little bit of a hodgepodge, a little bit of a hybrid. And I will say that this is actually my second time of filming this. So I've, um, I'm, I'm a batcher at heart. I like to get a chunk of content filmed and edited and scheduled ahead of time. So I don't feel like I'm doing it in the moment because that can get quite stressful. But because I did that, I didn't I hadn't finished the month of June and obviously like the month of June is where we have the cutoff point for the halfway of the year and I finished one of the best books that I've read this year on the 30th of June so I was like no I have to refilm that video so I can talk about it because this like it would not be a complete review a complete reflection without me talking about one of my brand new favorites so that's why we're doing this again Anyway, let's dive in by looking at some of my stats for the year. In 2022, so far, I have read 77 books, which is pretty good. So I'm ahead by 31 books. My goal for the year was 91. So I'm like, I'm definitely going to hit that in the next month or two. There is no question in my mind there. So my most read mood is emotional. So 48 books that I've read are tagged as emotional, 25 are tagged as reflective, 14 lighthearted and 10 funny and then we start getting into the teeny tiny slices. So yeah it looks like I like a balance of deep and amusing which feels accurate because I'm definitely a mood reader and so there are times when I'm like yeah I want to be so immersed and so invested in some in somebody else's story in something else and then there are times where I'm just like no I need a light-hearted distraction from life so that feels pretty accurate genres I'm very surprised by looking at this so the top one with 38 books is contemporary and then we have romance with 36 then we have lgbtqia plus which slight bug by here I don't think that's a genre how is that a genre It's not a genre like surely we should be seeing lgbt representation in all genres in all types of literature it feels weird to me that there's a separate section then we have poetry then fantasy surprising because i'm not the biggest fantasy reader literary not the biggest literary fiction reader actually either then we have mystery young adult, not the biggest YA reader, and historical. I'm surprised by how this is ranked because my favourite genre is actually historical fiction and I would say that my second favourite are like crime, mystery, thriller types of things. So yeah, this is surprising me and it might help explain why I've had quite quite a decent amount of time so far this year feeling quite frustrated by the books that I'm reading and like I'm just not having the best time so maybe I'm just not picking up the things that I know that I love why would I do that why am I sabotaging myself don't I want me to be happy that is the question of the day um but I think yeah we can we can turn this around in the second half of the year so I think I'm going to start being proactive about picking up more mystery thrillers and more historical fiction because I know that I always have a good time reading those two. Um, most read authors, we have Kennedy Ryan, Sarah J Maas, Mariana Zapata and Colleen Hoover. <laughs> I'm turning into like a basic booktuber, like that's for sure. Those are all of the stats that we're going to talk about today. Let's dive into the questions now. So usually during the mid-year free cut tag, the first question is best book of the year. But I want to approach this a little bit differently because there are things that so I wouldn't necessarily compare a collection of poetry to a classic, to like a series, to a standalone. Like when I rank things in my mind, they're sort of separate categories. So I want to talk about my favourites 
in line with that. So I'm going to start by talking about my favourite poetry of the year, and I have read quite a few poetry collections this year, but the one that really sticks out in my mind is definitely, definitely going to be Angel and Hannah by Ishley Yee Park. So I read this um, in March as part of Caridathon, and it is the retelling of Romeo and Juliet. Now, so we have Hannah, a Korean-American girl from Queens, and Angel, a Puerto Rican boy from Brooklyn. And they come across each other and fall in love and have this really like dramatic, passionate love affair that very much mirrors Romeo and Juliet, including all the tragedies. And it is told in poetry. And while, yes, these poems could stand alone, when read together, they also tell this like, beautiful, classic story of um, doomed love. And I was surprised by how much this could make me feel. Usually poetry does not make me feel to that depth. It just doesn't. Like, often when I read poetry, I will find it relatable. I will nod along and think, oh yeah, like, that speaks to me. But it doesn't depress me like it it doesn't make me feel the dark feelings this one did and it, it was really really good I I remember at the time when I was talking about it to a friend and I said I can't tell you it's enjoyable because it's not but it's so good and I stand by that that still feels accurate then the best classic that I've read has to be Sense and Sensibility by Jane Austen and you know this is not one of her most popular works obviously everybody adores Pride and Prejudice adores Emma but I've always had a special place in my heart for Sense and Sensibility it the film adaptation was one of my very favorites as a child I've seen it so many times I actually think I should rewatch it soon because it is iconic it really really is and I committed this year to reading all of Jane Austen's books with some friends so we're like buddy reading them together and for the most part, everyone else was like, no, like Sense and Sensibility, it has some moments, but it's not the best. Like it can be quite boring. Whereas I love it. I think that this is a work of comedy genius. I think the way that Jane Austen establishes these characters is just hilarious. Like <laughs> I just, I really love this. And even if maybe the language is a little bit dense and a little bit dry I'd suggest going and listening to the audiobook instead so there are some great um audio adaptations available on audible and the sense of sensibility one is good because it's it's slightly abridged so it simplifies some of the more like dense dry bits of text and just makes it a bit more accessible so you can enjoy the magic enjoy the comedy without feeling like you're deciphering some kind of code but um this was a reread for me really enjoyed it even though like objectively it's it's not my favorite one of her books my favorite is persuasion this is always going to just have that special place in my heart because of the adaptation like, i just love it i love the story so much i love the sister so much i love the villain so much it's just it's a good time. Um, then best short stories I've read this year. So you may have heard me talk about short stories a fair bit on this channel. I'm usually talking about how much I don't really like them. But I read The Secret Lives of Church Ladies by Dacia Filio this year and absolutely loved it. I thought it was brilliant. So relatable, so witty, so evocative. I really, really enjoyed that collection. So if you haven't heard anybody talk about it first of all where have you been everybody is loving it this year but essentially it is telling the stories of a series of um black women from different communities with different problems with different lifestyles but are all connected through their relationship to the church and it's not the same church like it's not one of those like interconnected collections where you know we're seeing overlap between the stories these are distinct stories that look at different generations of black women and what they're what they're really like what their thoughts are really like what their feelings are really like when from the outside they just look like well beha well behaved church going ladies and i just loved it i thought it was great there was only one story that i 
I wasn't like the biggest fan of. It was still good, but it just wasn't my favourite. Whereas the rest were top tier and I found it really hard to pick a favourite when I was reviewing it for my wrap up. Would highly recommend, even if you're not a short story lover, I think that would be a great place to start. Um, then if we're just going to talk about favourite book of the year, and I feel like I can't talk about rereads in this section, we'll talk about favourite rereads later. But there are two that are like vying for top spot in my mind. Mm, three. I'm going to talk about two and I will talk about the other one later when we start talking about sequels and series. So the two books that I absolutely loved and would describe as fan favourites. First of all, we have one that I read in January, which was Mary Jane by Jessica Anya Bloch. And I feel like I've talked about that already a fair bit on this channel. Otherwise, like, I've definitely talked about it somewhere, probably, probably on here, maybe to friends. Sorry if I'm banging on about it again. But this tells the story of 14-year-old Mary Jane, who is living life in suburban Baltimore in the 70s. And one summer, she gets a job as a nanny for this doctor's family. And little known to her very conservative family, the doctor is actually a Jewish psychiatrist who specialises in addiction. And he that summer, he ends up getting a rock star and his very famous movie star wife to stay with them while he's supporting the husband through addiction. And Mary Jane is brought into contact with these people and exposed to new ways of thinking, new ways of living that she'd never even considered before. And you just see this amazing maturing of this young woman who can take the positive pieces of her upbringing and acknowledge the things that aren't so great and acknowledge the ways that she wants to be different. And I just loved it. I thought the characters were all immaculate. I thought the vibes were really, really strong and I thoroughly enjoyed my time reading it. I would say that it's a great thing to read during the summer. It's very, very summery. But it was also a great thing to read in the winter when I was feeling like very glum and bleak and cold. Um, then I also have to talk about the last book that I read this month, More Than You'll Ever Know by Katie Gutierrez. And this was a cracker. So take Evelyn Hugo and make it true crime. Like that's how I'm summarising this book. But it tells the story of a young journalist named Cassie who currently works part time for a true crime blog. And so obviously she's, she's got all of her Google alerts set up to hear about sensational crimes taking place across the land. And as part of that, she comes across this story about this woman who in the early 80s ha was found out to have two husbands when one of the husbands murdered the other. And you know, it was a big thing at the time, but obviously it's faded away into history since then. But she like, she, she gets gripped by the idea of this story and she decides that she wants to be the first person to interview our bigamist woman, Lore. And Lore is never given an interview. She, she's never spoken to the press, but Cassie is determined to get the story. And so we follow her as she goes and like tries to figure out what happened. And we're getting sort of this modern day perspective of her like trying to convince people to talk to her, her like own personal life going to shit while she does. And Lodi's story of what actually happened in the 80s. And you get some great social commentary too, because it, um, Lodi's story is told 50% in Texas where she lives with one husband and 50% in Mexico City where she lives with the other husband. And so you're seeing a lot of the like social and political things that were going on at that time in those places. And that was stuff that I wasn't really aware of. So I felt like it was an educational experience too. But it had me by a chokehold. I read it in a day, honestly, so good, highly recommend. And it came out on my birthday. I always feel like the best books come out on my birthday. They just do. Okay, now let's talk about best sequels. So I have to say it's just got to be the Grip series by Kennedy Ryan. I read that whole trilogy in like three days. So good. It is a romance series that just tells the story of one particular couple across three books. So I think that you'll be missing so much if you just picked up one of them. But I love them. I love them. I love them. 
and it sparked a real love affair with Kennedy Ryan's writing as well because it's not just a romance there's so much more depth there's so much social commentary there's so much feeling I just adored it it had a real sense of magic um but the first so the our first book Flow is actually a novella I think it's only maybe 150 ish pages but it tells the story of Bristol who is flying across the country from New York to LA to try and reconnect with her estranged twin brother who when she arrives is working late so he sends his best friend Marlon to pick her up from the airport and the sparks fly. Nothing really happens but they, they, they have the feelings, they get to know each other and they have one of those nights that you only have when you're like in your teens where you stay up all night talking and it just feels like you're so seen and for the first time in your life and it's just it really captures that feeling perfectly but then something happens at the end of the summer that sort of pulls them apart and she goes back to New York and then our second book Grip is sort of their reconnection so it is eight years in the future Bristol is now living in LA she's a music manager Marlon is a rapper and they sort of have this professional relationship and it's really about how they navigate that and how they um he wants to pursue her she wants to preserve the friendship and it's just this sort of push and pull and it's delicious and then we have still which is the culmination of their story and I just thought that they were impeccable I've got them on Kindle Unlimited but I'll be buying physical copies because I love them that much they will definitely be rereads for me in the future um, I also want to talk about my best book club read because I've been a part of a few different book club kind of things this year so I have the book club that I have with a couple of friends that I used to work with and then I am in a few Patreons so we do buddy reads each month and I think my best my best book club experience so far has to be reading Mr Loverman by Bernadine Everisto. I thought that was a gem of a book. I had such a good time reading it. It tells the story of Barrington, a 74 year old Antiguan man living in London and he has been married for what 40, 50 years to his wife Carmel um, and the whole time he's been having a uh, an affair with his best friend Morris so he's a gay man who married a woman and has been living this lie and it is really about that dynamic because he decides at his ripe old age of 74 that he's done living a lie he just wants to be happy and it's really seeing how that plays in the sort of London Caribbean community and so we're told this story from two perspectives so we see Barrington Barry as he is you know 74 years old dealing with life currently his relationship with his wife his children his um friend Morris and his community and it's also his relationship with his own identity and his his perception of masculinity and then we have the story from the past which is told from the wife's perspective so from when they meet when they get married when they start having children all of that like we jump through time and just seeing like her perspective being in this relationship that has never felt quite right and the way that she looks at him and feels about their relationship and I just loved it I definitely have lots of thoughts I feel like I could do a whole video just talking about that book because there was so much packed in to such a short page count but it was a really great time I loved it and I love discussing it as part of our book club now let's talk about the best reread now I have reread a few books this year but without a doubt it has to be has to be Outlander so you'll notice that this is called Cross Stitch originally in the UK and Australia the first Outlander book was published under this name Cross Stitch and this is a, an old copy but I reread this because I want to read the rest of the series and it's been quite a few years since I'd read it and because it's so chunky and so much happens. I wanted to re-familiarise myself with the characters and the world. And it was stunning. I actually annotated it this time and had a lot of fun doing that. Because I've, I I, think because I've read it before and I've also watched season one of the show twice, I, I have thoughts and I have sort of, I don't know, ideas about where things are going to go. So I wanted to know them down before I went any further, either watching the show or reading the series so that I can like capture those for posterity but 
I had a stunning time reading this. Started the second book right away. Love, 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 love. Okay, then one of the questions that I wanted to add to the mix, which is the most stunning recommendation that I've received. And this could be, you know, a recommendation that was made to you personally. It could be a recommendation that um, you've just got from watching somebody else's video, somebody else's content. But I would have to say that the Grip series, and I, and I know I've already talked about it, but I remember watching a video by... Um, is it Christ so Crystal from Crystal's Bookish Life? I think that's her channel name. And she was talking about, you know, romances that make you believe in soulmates. And she talked about the third book in that series, so still. Um, and as soon as I heard her talk about it, even though she like dropped a tiny spoiler, which I usually don't like, I was like, I want to read that book. And so that day I picked up the first in the series and since then, Kennedy Ryan has had me in a chokehold that like I have read, I think, eight books by her this year because I've just been completely captivated by her stories, by her romances. I just, I can't help it. Now let's talk about adaptation. So the best adaptation that I've seen this year is going to have to be Little Women. So the most recent adaptation, I had never seen it. I'd seen the one from the 90s multiple times and wasn't the biggest fan. And I have to admit, Little Women is not one of my favourite classics, but the most recent adaptation is God's Team. Okay, I got cut off there. My phone started ringing, but I was gushing about Little Women. Yeah, the adaptation, so, so good. Really, really rate it. And there are actually a few adaptations that I'm excited for that I think will be coming out later on in the year. Daisy Jones and the Six being one of them, of course. And then I think I would also really like to go and see Where the Core Dads Sing, which I know is coming soon too. Um, oh, and the new adaptation of Persuasion. I mentioned that Persuasion is my favourite Austin. I've seen the trailer for the new Netflix adaptation and I think it looks really good. I know that it's been slated by like hardcore Austin fans, but honestly, I think it looks like a really fun time, so I don't care. New release you haven't read yet, but want to. The only one that comes to mind for me is again Rachel which is the follow-on from Rachel's Holiday which was released 25 years ago and I really loved reading that back in the day. I remember reading that as a young teenager probably when I was too young to be reading it but that's by the by. I also recently reread it so at the end of May beginning of June I reread Rachel's Holiday and it was as stunning as ever such a fun nostalgic time while also touching on some really important topics specifically like body image and addiction so would definitely love to see where Rachel is 25 years later most anticipated release for the second half of the year no idea it's not something I keep track of I'm not a new release girly so not a clue the biggest disappointment of the year there are a couple that I want to talk about here. So first of all, this like this one, let me just say, is not a bad book, but that is Clock Dance by Anne Tyler. And the reason that this was a disappointment for me is because I loved, like really loved the first two thirds of it. I thought it was going to be a five star, new favourite, best of the year kind of read, but it just, it lost some of that magic in the last chapter or so. I thought the last chapter was very rushed. The like the the conclusion was very anticlimactic, and it just didn't have exactly what I was looking for there. The rest of the book was very good, and I really enjoyed the writing style. So I will be picking up more by this author, but it was just disappointing for me because I had such high hopes. Speaking of high hopes. Gentlemen Prefer Blondes by Anita Luz. I cannot tell you how disappointed I was by this book. I honestly thought it was going to be a five-star read. I thought it was going to be a new favourite classic. And it's not. <laughs> Spoiler alert, it's not. I remember being 16, 17 and watching the film adaptation of Gentlemen Prefer Blondes and loving it. It was the first Marilyn Monroe film I ever watched and I was 
captivated. The book does not stand up to the adaptation. It just doesn't. I'm really disappointed because I'm on this quest to find the Jazz Age novel that works for me. I am because nothing that I've read from that era is even remotely likeable. It's just not. I haven't enjoyed a single one, which is a bummer because I feel like part of my soul lives during that period of history. So what's going on, folks? If you have a recommendation for me, hit the comments and let me know. But I just thought this was draining honestly it's so short as well it's like i don't know 140 page long page long this is actually a bind up of two novellas so it's gentlemen prefer blondes and but gentlemen marry brunettes could not stand it i've never had something that felt so exhausting to read while also being so fluffy so ditzy the whole time that because it's written like a journal it's written like her diary and being inside this character's brain made me want to stick a screwdriver in my ear it was maddening no 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 and I was so determined to love it as well the whole time I was reading it I was imagining what I would say in my wrap-up and how positive I would be and how complimentary I would be but then when it came down to it I was like Honestly, I didn't like anything. I did not like anything about this book. So, massive disappointment. Massive. Now let's 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 be positive again. Let's talk about my biggest surprise, and that's going to be The Descendants by Carrie Hart Hemmings. So I picked this up back in May when I was trying to read books by um authors with Asian or Pacific Islander heritage, and I loved it and I was really surprised obviously I thought I would like it otherwise I wouldn't have picked it up in the first place but there was something about this that spoke to my soul the way it touched on grief in such a real and irreverent way really got me so this is the story of a man named Matt who whose wife has been in a tragic accident and she is in a vegetative state she she's not gonna make it they're having to unplug her and when they get this news he decides that he is going to go and visit everyone they know and let them know so that they can go and say goodbye and while doing this he discovers that his wife was having an affair so he decides to go and you know tell the wife's lover that she is going to die so that he too can say goodbye and he has to take his two eccentric daughters because he's now having to learn how to be a father where his he was very much like the corporate man leaving the wife at home with the kids previously but now he has to be the one to step up and get involved in his kids life with the backdrop of him going through some um like big identity shifts because of his inheritance so long story short he is a descendant of the last princess of Hawaii and her like European merchant husband who owned the bulk of the island and he has lots and lots of cousins and they're all wanting to sell this land but as them the biggest shareholder he has the final decision so he has to decide who they're going to sell it to and all of that stuff and so he's trying to make that massive decision while dealing with letting go of his wife discovering who his wife really was taking on his kids who are both mad as a box of frogs and it was just really touching and really just spoke to me in ways that I didn't expect. Really enjoyed this and I can see myself rereading it again. My favourite new author has to, I have to say Kennedy Ryan because I've inhaled eight of her books this year and I'd never read anything by her previously. While there are like books that I've read by authors that I know I want to read from again, her like she is the only one where I've been like oh my god I need your entire backlist so yeah Kennedy Ryan favorite new character I have come across some cracking characters I really have I am going to say mm, who am I gonna say 
So Lottie from More Than You'll Ever Know, so the biggest lady, was a true icon. Like I said, Evelyn Hugo from Make It True Crime. I loved her. I absolutely loved her because she was so unapologetic. Like, yes, she had two husbands. She lied to them both. One of them ended up dead. One of them ended up spending 30 years in prison. Did she care? <laughs> Did she regret it? No to both of those questions. Absolute icon. I also thought um, Barry from Mr. Loverman was a delight. He was like such a lovable rogue. I mean, total misogynist. And yet, I really found myself rooting for him. Um, I'm trying to think of other characters that really stand out to me. Um, maybe I should also talk about Claire and Jamie from Outlander. Claire in particular, like, I really feel like she is such a stunning character. She's so well-rounded that you can, you feel like you are her. And I think it's because you are, like, literally in her mind for, what, a thousand pages just in that one book. And I, yeah, I love her. I'm rooting for her. I want her to have her happy ever after. And I know that it's going to be a long time till she gets it. There are nine books in this series and they're all chunky, chunky monkeys. Um, but I would say, yeah, like those are probably the most iconic characters that I've come across so far this year. Okay, books that made you cry. Only one. I'm not a big crier, but one book had me crying and not just like a tear. We're talking crying. And that was the third book in the Grip series by Kennedy Ryan. You might have guessed that this is soon becoming a Kennedy Ryan fan account. Um, but the third book in the series still definitely had me in tears something happens in that book that I'm not going to talk about because it is it like I consider it to be a spoiler some other people might consider it to be you know like a content warning situation but you know if you have triggers look those up for yourself had me in tears had me in tears and that was a really cathartic time I needed that cry I needed that cry I really did a book that made me happy. Oh my god, The Charm Offensive by Alison Cochran. I read that and I felt like I was just smiling the whole time. It was so heartwarming. It was so, I'm mean, even just talking about it now, I'm smiling. It was just, it was delicious. It was delicious. So it tells the story of kind of a fictionalized bachelor kind of show that is structured around fairy tales. And one of our love interests is um, one of the producers on the show. And his job is like help, obviously making the show entertaining, creating the love story dynamic and getting people where they need to be. And this season he is handling the star. So the guy who would be The Bachelor, who is really trying to um, get some good PR after a bit of a career malfunction. Um, but he is not loving life. He is not liking any of the women. He's not liking being on the show. It's just not happening for him. And then we see like these two men develop this stunning relationship and realise that they're falling for each other. And I just loved it. Like, it was so nice. Another book that's made, that has made me happy that I haven't even read yet is Snow Falling, which is the book that was written by Jane in Jane the Virgin. And I actually watched all of Jane the Virgin for the first time this year and had to buy myself the book for my birthday. Um, and seeing it arrive, that made me happy. Like I said, haven't read it yet, but owning it makes me happy. The most beautiful book that I bought, this is tricky because I'm not one of those people who buys like special fancy editions of things but I do have a few things that I've picked up that do have really striking covers so I'll show you some of those now um but I didn't necessarily purchase these because of the covers the covers are just you know coincidentally there so one is Laura by Vera Caspery so this is a really teeny tiny classic but I just think the face is so striking and it really gives you the like the film noir vibe, right? Then we have Howard's End by E.M. Forster. And I love how, so I pulled this one because I love how the painting like carries on around the spine 
This looks really cool sitting on my bookshelf. And then we have A Suitable Boy by Vikram Seth. And I just, I love how like clean and again striking this is sitting on my bookshelves. I love the colour palette. I just, yeah. I don't love how thick it is. It is, I think, the thickest book that I own. Yeah, it's over 1,500 pages and the text is fucking tiny. So I don't know if I will ever be brave enough to read this, but I love the cover. Um, okay, books that you still need to read this year. So I, you, you know by now I am queen of the mood readers. I don't necessarily have set TBRs or anything like that. I do have my 22 books that I want to read in 2022, which I'll link to in the description. Have I been making amazing progress on that? No. So I do want to read as many of those as I can by the end of the year. And then there are a few books that I sort of got on my immediate radar that I would really like to read. So I would love to read um, the next book in the Outlander series. I, I would actually love to read as many more of the Outlander books as I can. I would love to read this one, The Man Who Fell in Love with the Moon by Tom Spambauer. I bought this last year and I've really been feeling like I want to get to it soon. Um, and then, do you know what? There's another really like big, fat, chunky, scary book that I would like to read this year if I can. And that is The Memoirs of Cleopatra by Margaret George. I think I've talked about this one before on my channel, but this is... And the story of Cleopatra written like a memoir and you know it's massive it's hefty it's terrifying but I've always loved ancient Egypt and this is one that I would like to get to soon it also feels like a very summertime book anything that is set in a hot country feels like a summertime book for me so I do want to get to this soon I don't know like how how do you beat the big book fair that is my question for you if you have any tips for doing so Pop in the comments, help a girl out. If you've enjoyed this video, make sure you hit subscribe, but I'm gonna love you and leave you because this, this one is long. It does not need to be this long, but I just have a lot of things to say about the books that I read. So, you know, sorry, not sorry. I'll see you next time.